how to actually listen to Apple Music in lossless, M2 SSD scandals, Mac Pro rumours, Apple Reality and where on earth are you? Today it is iCafe Answers Day, so if you've got a question for the next one, use the hashtag down in the comments with your question. Tony Ward asks iCafe Answers, Apple has lossless audio on Apple Music and yet there are limited ways to listen to lossless. The speakers in Macs and iPads are limited from a sound production perspective. The AirPods Max use Bluetooth 5, which do not have sufficient bandwidth to do lossless, and the HomePod 2 has a speaker quality and is not limited by Bluetooth 5. Is there a just one more thing that Apple has not told us yet? Does AirPlay 2 have the bandwidth or do we need AirPlay 3? So first of all, the AirPlay part is kind of difficult because AirPlay uses both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi depending on which application you're using it for. If you're using it for just audio to AirPods, it's using Bluetooth standards. If you're going to a HomePod, then it's actually really just sending the source to your HomePod, which is then accessing it over Wi-Fi uh, directly from your network, so that's completely different. Um, so it's it's a little bit of a different thing, and also obviously if you're doing anything with video, then AirPlay has got to use Wi-Fi for that because there's definitely not enough bandwidth for Bluetooth video to be played in that way. Yes, there is a bit of a confusion uh, in terms of Max. Obviously, you can attach whatever speakers you want, and you can use Apple Music lossless. So, for example, here I've got my SoundStick set up on the desk which sound fantastic. But yes, with a Mac, you can connect to whatever speakers that you want. Obviously, with an iPhone or an iPad, you can actually use one of these little bad boys uh, to attach it to a headphone jack, which is actually a little uh, analog to digital converter in one of these, which is uh, interesting. So you can get it out of these things, but no, it's not easy. Um, you can use, obviously, the MacBooks now. Uh, no, I think all of the Macs have high impedance headphone jacks. So that is kind of your best way at the moment. There's a few cars that have got CarPlay, which have got uh, lossless and spatial audio built in. Um, but I think it's just one of those things. They have to create the standard and put it out there before people will build a way for you to listen to it. But yeah, I would love to at least get maybe the AirPods Max getting themselves some Wi-Fi. But we have seen in uh, the past few days that airpods max have gone to about two to three weeks shipping times is there an update on the horizon i would be surprised i would have thought it's going to be towards the end of this year before we get an update there and we're only hearing that they're going to be you know colors maybe apple is using some of the chips from the home pods to uh, to give those a little bit more bandwidth maybe they're going to connect directly to your wi-fi network rather than just to your phone or the device over bluetooth that could be a solution. Tim Kinetics asks, I gave answers, are the slow SSDs on the M2 MacBooks really an issue? Is it corner cutting that users will notice or is the storage still fast enough? And we covered this on yesterday's video, which was all about the, uh, the M2 Mac Minis and how, in all honesty, you're only really going to notice in a big way, and if you look at the way that all of these things have been benchmarked, uh, the difference in the time that it takes to transfer large files, if you've got enough space to store a lot of large files to move around. So the Mac Mini, of course, is great for adding additional uh, external storage, um, and you can obviously carry SSD drives around with you if you want extra storage on the MacBooks as well. Uh, in terms of the actual speed, I don't think it's going to affect day-to-day -day operations, but yes, if you're moving bigger files, and I'm, I'm talking like 20, 30 gigs at a time, uh, you might notice it, but I can't see that that many people buying the base model are doing much on these devices that isn't going to be either stored off the device itself in, in the cloud or, or whatever, or, you know, they're just using it more for office type stuff and content consumption where you're never going to see any issues at all. Can you find the differences when you do specific tests looking for them? Yes. Will it actually affect your day-to-day -day use of the devices? I really don't think so. Evan Rogers asks I gave answers, what is the purpose of the leaked M2 Ultra Mac Pro with no expandability? Isn't that just a Mac Studio? Should no GPU or storage expandability or the other PCIe peripherals be a deal breaker in calling it a Mac Pro? Now from my understanding, the Mac Pro with M2 Ultra that I, I don't think we should be getting mad about what it can or can't do before we've even seen it. I, I think that's a fool's errand. I think we're just going to be disappointed or wonder why we were even talking about it beforehand. But my understanding is you can't change the memory because that's part of the SOC. You wouldn't be able to put on GPUs because, 
again, it's a part of the SOC, the, the whole point of the way that Apple Silicon works, its efficiency, how easily everything kind of works together is that all of the uh, the memory is basically on chip. Now I'd spoken in the past about potentially having another level of RAM above that, almost think of it as cache levels, but it doesn't seem like that's what they're gonna do. But you would be able to expand storage. You are going to have PCIe uh, cards in there, so you would be able to expand I/O. So when Thunderbolt 5 becomes a thing, that's something that could potentially be added on a PCIe card, audio interfaces, all that kind of stuff that a lot of people do use with these. But what I don't see them actually doing now is putting in the ability to put one and a half terabytes of stick RAM in there. It, it doesn't make sense with the way that Apple Silicon works. And the same with GPUs. I don't see that they're going to do that, but you know that would please a lot of people whether the performance would be as good as people hoped is another matter because gpu manufacturers would then need to have drivers for apple silicon and that's where it's probably all going to fall down tim kinetics asks i have answers with more rumors coming out around the apple ar vr headset do you have any thoughts on a use case for it how will apple convince the masses to buy another piece of tech that is currently quite niche so one thing that i heard about the other day which i hadn't heard before but sounds bonkers is that the front panel of the vr ar headset is apparently going to show your eyes from inside it and, and this i can't quite get my head around what on earth that is going to be it sounds like a horrific horror movie thing i'm not convinced by it at all apparently this is something that johnny ive was really pushing for while he was at the company um so that you weren't kind of closed off from the world uh, but for that to look in any way okay it would have to be a very very sort of thin like not a deep uh headset so that your eyes aren't like two inches out from where your face is that would be really weird at best this is going to look like you're wearing ski goggles of some sort while you're walking around uh, I can't imagine this looking cool, but this may also explain why we were hearing about three displays. Maybe you get one for each eye on the inside, which gives you your 3D, and the third one is actually pointing outwards to display your eyes and your emotions and that kind of thing. The other things that we are hearing is that this is not going to be using like Memojis as a general uh, sort of interface. It's going to use you and you're going to look basically photorealistic in one-to-one -one chats. Now, the GPUs inside it are apparently going to be powerful enough for this to work in a way that we will actually be impressed by. I feel like there's going to be some uncanny valley going on, which basically is when things feel uncomfortable because they look so close to reality, but you can still tell they're not real. But I don't know. Beyond that, we still don't really know why. Like... We know that the technology exists. We know that the technology is moving on. It is expanding. More people are using it. But we don't know why Apple wants to do it and what they've got in mind for how this is going to connect people. We've heard a lot about gaming. It's going to have apparently a couple of hours of battery life on this battery pack that is belt mounted now, which doesn't seem very Apple-like. You're going to have to have a cable running down your back or down your side or down your front. I don't know. Uh, there's just a lot of conflicting rumors at the minute, so I don't really want to speculate too much. But some of the stuff sounds really interesting. Tim Kinesis asks, I have answers, why don't the iPad Pro models work with the Find My Network? Surely Apple can fit a U1 chip in a thousand dollar tablet that's almost as easy to misplace as an iPhone. I have genuinely no idea. Now we, we heard for a while that U1 was also gonna be used for data transfer for something along the lines of uh, MagSafe style transfers. My only thought is that uh, Apple wasn't ready to put MagSafe charging into the ipad pros yet and it was going to be somehow integrated into the same part so that you can basically slap your magsafe generation 2 onto the back of your I ipad and that would also facilitate u1 based uh, data transfers that would make sense because you know that that would be lined up it works incredibly fast by all accounts using ultra wideband over very short distances and that sort of makes sense for using a uh, magnetic puck that's attached to the back of your device so maybe that's all that's holding it back at the moment maybe we're just waiting for the next redesign for it to be uh, integrated because if you think about the other products that we've got they're not massive metal boxes 
with a U1 chip inside, so it could be more to do with the fact that we don't have a glass back or something along those lines for radio frequency uh, transparency. Team Connectors are Psychem Answers. I am super interested in the geographical breakdown of your audience. As a British guy who watches the show, I usually assume the audience are mostly British. The Mint Mobile partnership made me wonder about how many viewers are actually from the USA and won't even notice the hint of brum in Dave's accent. So yeah, right now, uh, it's somewhere around 30, 35% of my audience that come from the US, which is great. Um, um, it's then about 10% from the UK and then the rest of the world kind of makes everything up. Um, interesting for me, please do let me know where you're watching from down in the comments section and obviously with your next uh, iCave Answers questions. And speaking of Mint Mobile, regardless of what purchase you have your eye on next, basics like a new MacBook, a HomePod, or something more opulent like food, we all know that prices are rising. That's why I've partnered with Mint Mobile for this video to help save you money, thanks to that guy from those movies, Ryan Reynolds, because he owns it. Hey there, it's Ryan Reynolds, owner of Mint Mobile. Enticing, right? You can switch to Mint Mobile today and get premium wireless for as low as $15 a month without sacrificing your coverage, your speed, or your data because they're built on America's largest 5G network, keeping costs low by selling directly online without retail stores or salespeople. They just get me. Switching is super easy and with a digital eSIM and all of the iPhones since the 10s have supported eSIMs, you can sign up and activate right now on your phone from the comfort of your home. No standing around and you can keep your current device and phone number. And if you need a physical SIM, Mint Mobile will ship you one free of charge. All Mint Mobile plans include unlimited nationwide talk and text plus lightning fast 5G and free mobile hotspot. Mint Mobile will show you how much data you use each month and recommend the right plan to save you money or check out their modern family plan. Super affordable and starting at just two lines. Use my link mintmobile.com forward slash iCaveDave in the description and you'll get premium wireless starting at just $15 a month. Stop paying more than you need to on your wireless bill and start saving with my partner Ryan Wren. Uh, Mint Mobile. Thanks to Mint Mobile for supporting the show. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have got a question for the next show, hashtag iCaveAnswers down in the comments section. Thank you to all the lovely Patreons over here who help to support the show. You can join them on iCaveDave.com forward slash Patreon. Um, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.